Greetings. This is the commentary and sermonette on the song, Get Up. I have it as number 138, and the date that I have on here is July 13th, 1983, and I have old. So this would have been a song even earlier than that, and I just finished it up on that day. Today is July 17th, 2020. So this got a few years on it. I think the reason I wrote this song is because after becoming a Christian, it doesn't mean you do not sin anymore. And in fact, the reason of becoming a Christian is you've been convicted of how much you do sin, and you see that you're in trouble with God and you need a Savior. So when you call on the Lord because you realize you're sick and you need a physician, when you're pardoned and forgiven, then your relationship to sin changes somewhat. Well, sin is still sin, it's been forgiven, and so when we sin and we're convicted of it, it doesn't mean we should be crippled by it. I want to get right into the lyrics because that's the thrust of this. Get up, get up, so you stubbed your toe. Maybe went down and even scraped your nose. Get up, get up, the Lord's got things for you to do. Let him dust you off, it's part of his school. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Clothed in him, the Father now sees us. On the cross, the Father got even with us. With full wrath, he crushed the Son, Jesus. So when I start the song, Get Up, Get Up, So You Stubbed Your Toe, he talks about stumbling blocks that can be put in front of us either by others or maybe our own besetting type sin. Well, so you've stubbed your toe, you fell down, and you maybe even scraped your nose. So there's penalties that happen, just like an accident. Well, with sin, there's negative consequences that come. The get up, get up, the Lord's got things for you to do. Let him dust you off, that's part of his school. Why? I'm just going to say it, because there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Clothed in him, the Father now sees us. When we call upon the Lord, we are given the blood of Christ to pay for our sins but also the righteousness of Christ. So these are the garments of salvation. So we're under that 100% forgiveness and 100% righteousness. And it's a position that's really a judicial determination when we call upon the Lord that is granted to us of forgiveness, pardon, and righteousness. That's why we would say Jesus is our savior or deliverer He's a deliverer from our sin, but he's also a deliverer in terms of giving us the righteousness we need to stand before God and even to come to him, but particularly to stand before him. See, because on the cross, the Father got even with us. With full wrath, he crushed the Son, Jesus. That comes from Isaiah. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him. We thought him to be stricken smitten of God and afflicted. In other words, when Jesus was on the cross or heading to it, all these negative things came against him and so we thought he was stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening punishment for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. A little later it says, The Lord Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. And if he would render himself as a guilt offering, which he did, then God the Father would see his offspring, prolong his days, the good pleasure of the Lord would prosper in his hand, and as a result of the anguish of his soul, God the Father will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. So it was on the cross that the Father got even with us. Justice was meted out. And Jesus suffered that crushing blow in order to have our sins paid for. So we're clothed in him. That's how the Father now sees us. And on the cross, he got even with us. Because in full wrath, with full wrath, he crushed the Son. Jesus. So get up. Get up. Rouse yourself. We're in war. May we understand this truth to our soul's core. 
Shake yourself, shake yourself from the dust and rise up. Loose yourself, loose yourself from the chains around your neck because there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Clothed in him, the Father now sees us. On the cross, the Father got even with us in full wrath. He crushed the Son, Jesus. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. And I go into an instrumental break. Now, as I start this second verse about get up, rouse yourself, we're in war. May we understand this truth to our soul's core. This is difficult, but God calls us soldiers. And he says no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life in order that he might please him who has enlisted him as a soldier. So God calls us to spiritual warfare. I think you all know that. You've heard that. Because he says our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. It's actually Satan and his agents that is our primary enemy in this life. Now, people in the flesh do a lot of things. But even with that, God wants us to continue to look past just the flesh. Because it is designs from spiritual wickedness that is primarily arrayed against us. I think maybe some of the reason behind this is that any flesh and blood that's around us now that is an enemy, they can also become a Paul. Saul can become a Paul. There's nothing too difficult for the Lord. So I think with flesh and blood, we see past them as much as possible, knowing that they can get saved. And they might not get saved that we ever know about. It could be at the very end of their life. These fallen angels, on the other hand, there is no remedy for them. They have fallen and they are bent on death and destruction. With people, there's always hope that they might be granted sense from God conversion can happen. So maybe that's part of the reason, too, we're to recognize this warfare more as against spiritual wickedness. But we're to shake ourselves from the dust and rise up. That's again like you've fallen. Well, you know, you don't stay down there. We're in a war and you get back up. Maybe you've taken a hit and a bullet has hit you. Well, the most courageous ones are the ones that are hit and yet they get up and they keep moving forward. We might have to get a few purple hearts along the way. Loose yourself from the chains around your neck. That's again a way of saying the things that are weighting you down, you need to get those chains off of you that are holding you down. Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us or engage in the battle that's set before us. Now that comes I think to another thing I might say is as a soldier, the soldier is not responsible for assigning the mission that they are on. That goes to the authority structure above the soldier. In our case, Jesus said, one is your leader. Just like he also said, one is your teacher. It's even Christ himself. We need to get our marching orders directly from the Lord himself as far as what to do. But as far as also being the teacher, we need to ask the teacher what it is he's wanting to teach us. We can make our requests known on what we want to learn. We can make our requests known on what we think we want to do. But somehow we need to hear the voice of the Son of God. This is the way. Walk in it. Habakkuk said, I'll stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may respond when I am reproved by him. So as the leader, as the teacher, we need direction from him of what to do and what to work on as far as what chains are holding us down, but also rising up and what mission to go forward on. As I was editing this, it seemed like what I just said is a little more philosophical or theoretical rather than practical. So there's one verse that's very important about this guidance from God or what we should be doing with our life. For it is God who is at work in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. Many times, the way we're going to know God's direction for us is if there's something that we want to do and we know that it's not sin, that's God working in us. Many people call it like a burden. I know at one time I was working at a place called Turning Point, which was a Christian drug rehab. And when the job 
ended, one of the ladies there said, well, Robin is going to be going to the street mission next because she could see that my heart burden was there. She saw it before I saw it as far as what the next chapter was. So it is God who's working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So if there's something that you feel a burden towards or something you want to do, you can step back sometimes and know this has got to be God because my natural person, before I would have never desired to do something like this. And then where he gives the willingness, he also then opens up the doors. And there's another passage where Jesus said he opens up doors no one can shut and he closes doors no one can open. So many times the guidance of God is very subtle and often we'll get through it and we'll look back and we can see the steps that led us there and see God's hand in it. Sometimes you can see it beforehand and you know that's where he wants you to go. Sometimes you figure it out afterward. I wanted to bring that in to make this a little more practical and less mystical, you might say. Now, if you think I'm saying, go ahead and sin. Doesn't matter. You're a Christian. There's no condemnation. Well, if you think that's what I'm saying, take one step back and hear this phrasing. No way, no way, for sin is death, full stench. God's love, no way, should we ever quench it. By twisting truths in the sun, he frees us from sin and its domination. No condemnation and holy living, that's the teaching. Pardon, but no presumption. That, in a nutshell, gets a lot of what our attitude is to be towards sin as a Christian. We're forgiven, but we're not to stay in it. Why? Because sin is death. Full stench. It produces death. It always leads to death. There's nothing productive that ever comes out of it. And we shouldn't twist God's love and quench it by twisting these truths that are found in the Son, because the whole thing is he frees us from sin and its dominion or domination. Paul, he had problems with people that were saying, okay, the one that sins much, sins forgiven much. Where sin is abounded, grace is much more abounded. So let's go ahead and sin up a storm so that more grace can come. And Paul says their condemnation is just. He says those who have been forgiven for sin, shall we continue to live in it? God forbid. I mean, that makes no sense. When you become a child of God, he has expectations for us just like we do our own children on behaviors, what we do and what we don't do, what our priorities are, our agendas, everything. And so God forgives us for our sin, but our sin as a Christian can still bring out his ire. He talks about his anger maybe for a moment, but his faithfulness lasts for a lifetime. He scourges everyone he welcomes as a son. He rebukes disciplines. Well, that doesn't happen with no emotion, but his anger towards us for our sin as a Christian, it is always designed to bring about proper behavior for our good and our benefit, to clean us up and correct us and get us stronger in him. God's response to the unsaved for sin is punishment. It is not at all calculated to bring about righteousness. When he works with us, the anger is designed towards us to where it does in the end bear the peaceful fruit of righteousness. It's an amazing thing. The anger of God, when it's directed towards his children, has a completely different purpose than when it's directed to those who are outside of Christ. So with this in mind, I'm saying, awake, awake. Clothe yourself in his strength. So you get up when you've messed up, you sin, and it's like, what am I doing? Why have I done this? And you clothe yourself in his strength like, God Almighty, please help me to gain your power to overcome this and to, to, to lay this stuff aside. Now, the big key here is being honest with God about it. I've mentioned this before, but as a young Christian, I'd come out of a relationship where I wasn't married. We were living together. The Lord saved me in the midst of all that. That ended, he brought me out of all that. Well, I was still a young man and still with desires for females and that's never changed. And I would get at the end of the day and I'd get before the Lord to pray. I'd be saying, Lord, I'm really sorry that I was looked at this woman and I was thinking this and then I'm really sorry day after day after day about how sorry I was for that. 
And I started that one night and then I stopped and I said, you know what, I'm not really sorry about that. In fact, if I had it my way, here's what I would do. And it just hit me. Now I know why you died. Because even on my knees when I'm praying to you, I'm still lying. I was lying to him about this being sorry for this sin and wanting to get away from it. It was at that point when I got honest with him and I asked him to help me to see it the way he sees it, that then some progress began. So we got to clothe ourselves in his strength, which means, first of all, we got to see it the way he sees it to some degree and be convinced to some degree that sin is evil and it's destructive. And then calling on him for the tools necessary for us to fight these things. And the goal is to put to death the deeds of the flesh. So I'm saying, awake, awake, clothe yourself in his strength and add to your faith moral excellence. The way we'll add moral excellence is by putting away sin and then getting in habits of righteousness. Again, this is all tied in together as far as being serious about sin and having convictions about it, about it that it is evil, and then getting power from God to then overcome it. Awake, awake. Allow yourselves to be built up. Build yourselves up. Rise and with Jesus sup. I like this because the allow yourselves to be built up, it's a passive there. And this really goes right along with uh, Hebrews 13. Allow yourself, it's a command, but it's a passive to be persuaded by those who are leading, because we only have one leader, and it's a participle there. Those who are leading and yield. You don't yield to them. You yield to the accuracy of the information that they're sharing. So you're to allow yourself to be persuaded by those who are leading, those who are more mature in the faith or those in a position. You listen, and then you examine everything carefully to see if what they're saying is indeed correct. And then, when you're persuaded that they are right, you yield. If you're not persuaded they're right, that it lines up with the Word of God, you do not yield. I mean, Peter at one point was sharing with people. He'd walk with Jesus Christ, and Paul came and rebuked him. You're getting people to submit to this Jewish tradition, and you don't even live under it, Peter. And so, the people would have rightly stood against Peter, and Paul did. But he said even Barnabas was getting caught up in that hypocrisy. You allow yourself to be built up. In other words, you've got to remain teachable. I mean, that's why you're watching this right now. You think for whatever reason, maybe I have something I can offer you. I hope that's why you're watching this. And then build yourselves up. So we also take the aggressive action we need to be jealous for our own souls and be in the Word of God and be asking God to teach us great and mighty things we do not know. In other words, to seek Him. He says, you'll find me when you seek for me with your whole heart. And we're to take his yoke upon us and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We need to aggressively be in the things of God, asking him to help us where we're building ourselves up, knowing the whole time, knowing the whole time that we grow with the growth which is from God. We can't grow ourselves, but we can apply ourselves, and God will honor that because he wants us to grow. So we do our part and he will honor that, back that up, and he will make sure that we indeed are growing. So it's a combination of both things. So awake, awake, allow yourselves to be built up, build yourselves up, rise and with Jesus up. And you know, Jesus talked about, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and opens up, I will come in to him and I will dine with him, and he will dine with me, we'll sup together. And I always tell people when I bring that up that if you have somebody that wants to come in and sit at the table with you, or they want to come in and just fight and bicker and point fingers, or, or they want to come in and talk, discuss, reason, inquire. Christianity is a beautiful thing. The aim is to now leave off our sin not like those who've no knowledge of him, forever changed as the Father's children, sons of light, night is passing. So get up, get up. So you stubbed your toe. You might have even gone down and even scraped your nose. Get up, get up. The Lord's got things for you to do. 
Let him dust you off. That's part of his school. And it is. The righteous may fall seven times, but he doesn't stay down. You get back up. Because there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Clothed in him, the Father now sees us on the cross. That's where the Father got even with us for our sin. Because with full wrath, he crushed the Son, Jesus. That's it. So get up. Come on, get up. Get up. It's a very lighthearted song, goofing around a little bit with the tune and the tenor of the whole thing. But it's a very, very solid message. Even in the photos that I put with this, one of them I had in there is Awake and Awake, that's Claire, and that was when we were at the uh, 2017 solar eclipse. That was amazing. But Awake, Awake, you know, like I'm saying that to her, and add to your faith moral excellence. That's what I want for both of my daughters and their husbands and children and children to be that they are in the faith and they add to it moral excellence. But in the video, the last photo is one of Betty Boop. Now, I don't know if you know who she is, a little cartoon character that was in the 30s. And she was from the Roaring Twenties, a flapper, fun-loving girl, pretty loose, but pretty naive. Well, then the, the 30s come and depression comes. So her world that she was flourishing in has now been demolished. So I have her at the end of this thing because, you know, Betty Boops can fall and the Lord can pardon and then you rise and you get up. Well, I think I'll close with that. <clears throat> like I always say, listen to the things of God and you will learn great and mighty things that you do not know. I've been in this over 40 years and I am more excited to learn more from this book, the Bible, then even the first day I started, I've got a Master of Divinity for what that's worth, an Associate of Divinity, a year to Bible College, and I've been aggressive in, in the Word of God for all these years, and it is as fresh to me today as it's ever been. It's just an astounding thing, and the knowledge that's available, the wisdom from God, the understanding on subject after subject after subject is truly inexhaustible. And I am more excited about these materials today than I've ever been. It has never diminished because his material is indeed inexhaustible. And you listen to these things and learn these things and you will indeed live.